and welcome to Speech Communication 4345, Crisis Communication. I'll be introducing our guests shortly. Uh, first of all this evening though, we're going to be talking a little bit about healthcare systems and some of the communication variables and factors that are operative uh, in hospitals, in uh, doctor-patient relationships. Our focus this evening will be on hospitals, but we're concerned about the healthcare environment as a whole, uh, medical communication in general. We're going to find that there are a number of problem areas that uh, are potential crisis situations and that these are areas that have communication factors that are uh, operative in those. Some potential problem areas that may occur and we'll look at these briefly and then we'll tie into our guests. Uh, some potential problems in communication that occur may be between the health care providers and the patients themselves. Oh, off the top of your head, what kind of people provide health care? Doctors? Doctors? Nurses? Nurses? Okay, EMTs? Oh, yeah, hold down your buttons up. There's, what they're saying are doctors, patients, therapists, EMTs. Okay, there are a number of folks that are health care providers. So when you see that term up here, this is a generic uh, term that uh, refers to all these kinds of personnel. Okay, sometimes there's a role uncertainty that's involved. Uh, you may not, if you're the patient, you may not know who this person poking and prodding on you is and, and why they are doing what they're doing, particularly if you've been unconscious or uh, if you're in a, a transient sort of state. But often as a patient, you're not sure what your role is supposed to be. Are you just supposed to passively uh, lie there and let them work on you? Do you have responsibilities in getting better? Uh, I remember the one time that I was hospitalized and I was still making phone calls and conducting business and flitting around the room. The, the nurse in charge came in and said, you know, you might get well faster if you started acting like a patient. And I said, oh, okay, but you may have to tell me what a patient's supposed to do. You know, because fortunately, and she was more than happy to do that. And she said, you start by getting in bed, you know, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, but, but what kinds of roles are involved? And uh, we may see more of that. Okay, often there are responsibility conflicts. Uh, who's in charge of what? Uh, uh, who's, what the span of control within the organization is. Uh, sometimes, you know, nurses are in charge of some functions. Doctors are in charge of, of other things. The volunteers in the hospital may provide uh, some services. There are some things that patients can do and not do for themselves. There are some things that uh, the family members may do and not do. But not always are all of those lines of responsibility clear and they may come into conflict. Uh, power differences, who's in, kind of ties into the same sort of thing, but who's in control, who takes orders from whom, uh, we may be looking at that, and particularly when the, the hospital gets into a crisis situation. Who is in charge, who takes orders from what person, where those lines of authority may be. And because communication is such an integral part of the process, there may be unshared meanings. Uh, the jargon that the doctors and or nurses use uh, may leave patients completely confused. Now we've talked that you know, long-term illness patients often get very familiar with the jargon and uh, become very adept at understanding what's going on. But if this is a new experience for the patient or if it's a new experience for the family, then there may be confusion in processes, in procedures, in the labels that are placed on things. And so that's another potential area of difficulty between the healthcare provider and the patient. Okay, the problems may continue uh, between the healthcare providers and the family members. Uh, how much the family is permitted in is a, a function of the type of illness, some of the policies of the hospital. Uh, what the family is and, and is not allowed to do. Uh, sometimes there's limited personal contact. Maybe you're a responsible family member and you have questions for the doctor, but can you get to the hospital at 6 a.m. when they make rounds in order to 
head them off at the pass and ask those questions. Uh, the more famous the doctor, the more eminent the surgeon, or whatever, the greater the entourage of personnel that will probably be uh, trailing along behind, and the faster they'll be moving, and the, the greater the buffer zone in there. So the amount of contact that the family members are even able to have with the health care providers may be a factor. And then, of course, there's, there may be very limited access to information. Uh, generally, the, and we're talking about family members here, but this affects the patient too. Generally, you don't get to pick up your own chart and read it. Even if you could pick it up, you probably couldn't read it. You, know, you wouldn't know what it said when you looked at it unless uh, from some other uh, source you've had some kind of, of training and uh, are capable of decoding that information. So trying to get information about the nature of the illness, information about the uh, procedures of the hospital, there, there may just be a problem in information flow. And many of you know from your organizational communication classes that organization, depending on the organizational culture that you're in, and that will vary from hospital uh, to hospital, from small private hospitals to larger uh, public hospitals and so on, that the amount of information there uh, it varies in its distribution, that there's an absolute information that exists, you know, all that total information within uh, the healthcare environment, but then there's distributed information. And, and what the doctors and what the nurses know uh, may or may not filter completely through to the patient, may or may not filter completely through to the families. Uh, particularly in terms of procedures and, and technical kinds of things. Okay, besides all those potential areas of communication problems, there are often problems between the professionals themselves. Uh, and if you watch a lot of television uh, medical drama, you at least get a flavor of that, or how realistic that is. It's kind of like cop shows and detective shows and and other things. You know, uh, my week in the hospital, it seemed to be a really smooth running floor. People were congenial. You know, I didn't hear crises occurring out at the nurses' station. I didn't hear doctors screaming at the nurses or nurses screaming at the doctors or anything. But I'm sure there are those times, and, and particularly when the hospital or the doctor's office or whatever context you may be in, uh, does get under roll stress. They get under stress and there may be uh, stress between the roles themselves. Uh, the responsibilities that the people have, the expectations about the jobs uh, that they're performing. So some stress may come there. Uh, there may be, in some instances, lack of interprofessional understanding of uh, adequate respect and understanding for uh, the role that the LVN has or the therapist has or the uh, volunteer has different people, as we'll be seeing throughout uh, this class, have a number of responsibilities. And most of us have a pretty ethnocentric view of the world that says whatever I'm doing is the most important role at the time. And uh, when those roles start to bump into each other, then there may be problems. Uh, then the final area uh, that I just want to mention is autonomy struggles. Again, that gets into span of control who is in charge of what. And when those lines of delineation are not clear, then there may be problems uh, in that particular area. Robert. Are most of the um, medical professionals taught to, taught to, the, to keep from having a lack of interprofessional understanding? I mean, aren't they kind of, don't they have classes in there that that's part of the training well, that they have to learn to deal with? Right. But so, they don't all make straight A's, and they don't all practice everything they've been taught. So, and and this, you know, most of the time, I think most of the environments run very well. But uh, part of of the material I'm giving you tonight is out of this book called Health Communication Strategy for Health Professionals by Northhouse and Northhouse, and uh, you know the research that's reported in texts like that one says that this is, these are the areas where 
the problems arise when they arise, but not that everybody's freaking out each evening of the week. Yeah, go ahead. The reasons why I say that is because uh, when, I, when I always talk to people who are in the medical profession or anything, they talk about having to do the science and math part of their, their uh, degree, mm -hmm. but I very rarely ever hear them talking about classes or whatever that they take concern, concerning about like patient re relation, patient doctor relations and stuff like that. And only now, since I've been taking this class, am I starting to ask them questions like, you know, what what are some of the things you have to do? You know, what are some of the things that... Well, and I think some of the doctors, and we'll ask our consultant to follow up on this in just a few minutes, but my experience as a volunteer, and I probably have six or seven years total volunteer work in three different hospitals, is that some uh, medical personnel just instinctively are better caregivers from an empathy standpoint. Some are brilliant, but they lack in caregiving skills. And others may not be quite so brilliant. You know, and, and so the question becomes one, who do you want operating on you? The jerk who knows exactly what they're doing, or the lovey touchy person who drank too much coffee? That, you know, I don't think you have uh, those polarized choices. But some people are, are just instinctively better caregivers. And seeing doctors call on patients. Okay, uh, let's shift gears here. I have with me, scoot on over here, Chuck. Uh, this is Chuck Edmonds, and uh, for some 20 years, maybe more, I'm not sure how old Chuck is, uh, he was at St. Luke's Hospital, where, in the Texas Medical Center, where he pr uh, performed in a variety of roles from researcher to administrator. Uh, he eventually became an executive vice president and uh, had a variety of chores and experiences there, but now is running his own business, which is a healthcare consulting business. And uh, so we brought him in. He's a longtime friend of mine, too, and a nice person, and he promises that, that it's good for you to ask questions, that we want to keep this interactive this evening. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw the first question to him as, as you're thinking about things by asking just sort of broadly, what kind of crises do hospitals have and how do they manage those? Well, thank you very much. And um, in thinking about that, probably the, the easiest thing for us all to relate to right now is what happened in Oklahoma City. Um, every hospital, uh, part of what makes a hospital get it, uh, an integral part of, of how they work is they have to be accredited and part of the joint commission that accredits each hospital says that they have to have what they call an emergency plan so every <clears throat> at least once a year and, and usually more often than that they have little dry runs where they'll say okay we're gonna have a, a fake emergency and, and they'll tell two or three people like the head of the emergency room, what's going on, and so on, but they won't tell anybody else, and all of a sudden, the emergency room is swamped with patients, and thus and so, and they've made up beforehand a, a little uh, scenario of, well, we've had this problem or that problem, and they go through how do you triage the patient, how do you make sure you have the resources that you need. And those kinds of drills get real boring if you're on the, on the drill side of them, but it's when you have situations like we had in Oklahoma City that you begin to think that aren't we glad we've been through the drill so we really do know what's going on. And in each one of those situations, and it happens here in Houston a lot as well, <clears throat> those things are coordinated with law enforcement, with the fire departments, with the EMTs, with the, all the ambulance programs <clears throat> so that they don't have an absolute panic of well, let's take all of the patients to a single hospital because we thought of that one first. But in <laughs> fact, they're distributed. It's happened in Oklahoma. Most of those kids, <clears throat> there is a, a, a pediatric hospital in Oklahoma City, and that one was the one that justifiably should have gotten all the children. Um, <clears throat> but they, there was some coordination going on, kind of like in the old days of the civil, uh, civil defense uh, arena where they had... Uh, <clears throat> In that situation, the uh, county who knew um, the numbers of patients, where they were, so that, that uh, you know you could call a central 911 and say, "My name is Smith, and my brother was working in the uh, 
in the building on the third floor and do you have any idea or any information so that there's not absolute panic out there in terms of the overall care of what's going on. Within the individual hospitals, there are people that have to coordinate who's, you know, we, at, at our hospital, we've got a, a great burn unit, so we'll take the burn patients. Uh, the hospital down the street is very good in cardiac business, let them have the ch crest, chest problems, uh, the pediatric hospital and so on. And so there's a, a triaging amongst the hospitals to say, we're going to all do our part here. And because hospitals by nature tend to be a very caring kind of thing, there's, there's an awful lot of coordination and cooperation. And can you give me some ICU nurses off of this, you know, here, there, and yon, so that in fact, we're going to run these over and above our normal staffing levels. We need so that the hospitals actually trade staff at, sometimes at in a times, crisis. If in a crisis of the magnitude of, of that sort of thing, to a much lesser degree, when we saw the ammonia truck problem we had back 15 you all years or that. so, some of them weren't born. You may yeah. have to. <laughs> <laughs> I many, remember it <laughs> many years ago, and it, it begins to date us, I guess. Uh, okay, they had but, ammonia truck, or you can describe. Well, we uh, at the interchange of 59. And, uh, and 610, there, there, if you were coming up, going north on 610, as you swung around and went on to, uh, down onto 59, going out the Southwest Freeway, just as you made the turn, an ammonia truck, or a big tank truck full of ammonia, uh, blew a tire and literally dropped down on, on the top of 59 as it came under the freeway and headed into town. And so there was the immediate crisis of the trauma of the patients and the people that that were involved in the accident, needless to say. the accident itself, but you also had the, the fumes and the problems of people that drove through it unknowingly and inhaled that and literally burned up their lungs. And so we, we've had some of those kinds of things here in town. We've seen that with uh, Carla, was a, 1961 was a big uh, uh, hurricane here and we had a problem there. We've had floods of significant magnitude in Houston, and, and we saw, well, last year in the flooding, there was some of that. But in those situations, you begin to know what you're looking for, and you begin to think about, now, what's going to happen when? In all those hospitals, you have situations where you have emergency generators, you have plans and procedures and protocols already lined out, so you know what you're going to do, who's going to be in charge of what, who's going to do things. And, and it runs all the way through the plant facility, as well as just the immediate issue of taking care of that particular patient or those particular set of patients, uh, do we have the power we need? We've had situations in the medical center where uh, the emergency power situations weren't what they are today and literally you had patients on, res on respirators and the emergency power didn't come on in time and you had people with AMBU bags who had all those people on respirators literally standing there by hand keeping those patients alive. So that happens in a setting of the magnitude of the medical center, and again, it hasn't happened there for years, but it has happened. And so in a community, uh, something less than the size of Oklahoma City, if power goes out, what do you do? So they plan for that sort of thing all the time. Um, without that, you'd have absolute pandemonium and, and a pure crisis going on. So they do that, and, and again, the Joint Commission recognizes the importance of that, and so there's an integral part of that whole process they'll go through that and they'll say, all right, what would happen if, and you, uh, you have those kinds of, of dry runs all the time. Um, those kinds of problems are, are compounded, again, using the Oklahoma City situation. Uh, no sooner had they transferred all those pediatric patients than the hospital itself received a bomb threat. And the bomb there, even though it turned out to be a bogus threat, the drill went right back into um, into motion. Now we have, we are not only the, the provider of care in a crisis situation, but we ourselves are undergoing a crisis situation. And so um, they went through and orderly evacuated a lot of the nurses, which diminished from the care of the patients, obviously, but literally they had, a, again, they had a plan that they had to go through and say, all right, in this situation, the only people that were there had to volunteer and so on and so forth because they had no way of knowing whether that was a real threat or, a, or a, just, you know, some copycat guy that was trying to do whatever he wanted to do. So from the, literally from the, the mega perspective of communications 
throughout multiple activities of fire and safety and, and uh, police protection and traffic control, right down to the, the uh, summoning of, of the right kinds of professional people. We, we've got a situation here where we've had a, a big outbreak in, of gas inhalation and we need uh, uh, all the respiratory therapists on call and so on and so forth. The whole thing is coordinated and run clear through the entire entire uh, spectrum so that it uh, makes it makes it work pretty well. How's that for starters? That's Fair good. Enough. We brought you some water. If you Thank want you. It. Thank You're you welcome. very much. Um, Any questions out wanna... here? Okay, Miriam. Um, were you as surprised as I was about the nurse that was killed? I mean, the the falling debris that was uh, that surprised me. It, you know? Yeah, it it did, and uh, and yet you, you know, people get get caught sometimes, and uh, um, people that work in healthcare, a lot of times they they are in, inordinately healthy people, but they um, sometimes we think, well, it it couldn't happen to a nurse, or it couldn't happen to a, you know, to a physician, and and it does. Uh, we had a situation here in town where um, a nurse uh, associated with one of the, the better known trauma situations here in town um, died, it turns out, uh, from a hepatitis infection that it, it was just a fluke, it should never have happened and so on. And, and healthcare professionals get, get caught like that once in a while and it's, it's sad. I was surprised, you know, I, I would think that they would have been so careful you know, from the looks, from what we saw on television, yeah. it looked like it was just falling apart. Yeah. I thought they would have been more careful. But it wasn't a TV show. I know. Where it was yeah. all planned. Where it was all planned, yeah. And that's the sad part. And, and, and for those of us who all we know of it is what we see on television, uh, is as high a technology as we have today and, and the wonderful things that can be said about the visual business, it's real hard to really appreciate the gravity of that sort of thing. I, I guess the one, one thing that sticks in my mind was the w little shot they showed one night of these guys a block or two away, the welders were just going crazy and what they were doing was building the support beams to come back in there to try to hold the building up to keep it from you know, collapsing any further and I hadn't really thought about that but before they could put people back in to start groping around and pulling it apart, they had to make sure that structurally they had the support in place to keep that building in place. And, and those are the things that are hard for us as kind of third party observers to, to really appreciate just, you know, how, how graphic is that situation. Nancy. We all know that healthcare is trying to streamline uh, the personnel to make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. But how does that happen? I, we've all seen the picture of the nurse watching crying as she watched the little baby, the you know. Yeah. I mean, if, if your uh, health care providers, if, if, if it's streamlined, how does that work in a crisis like this when you have people that have to, you know, I mean, you have more, almost more trauma than you can handle? Well, I, th I think that, that uh, we're, we're working on two ends of the, of the spectrum here. The, the issue of, of streamlining health care um, is, is large enough that we could talk the whole rest of the semester or next semester, but the reality is we, as a society, we do probably have excess capacity uh, in, uh, certainly in this city and in most cities in terms of do we have uh, too many beds, do we have too many nurses. Uh, case in point, in the early 1970s, uh, there were about 150 physicians per 100,000 population in America. Today, there are about 250 physicians per 100,000 population in America. Are we two and a half times sicker than we were 20 years ago? So where do you, you know, how do you look at capacity and how do you look at, at capability? And, and then you have to come back, though, and look at your, your question is what happens in a, in a crisis situation, an emergency situation, do you still have the capability of taking that on? And there have been, uh, and right off the top of my head I can't give you an example, but I'm sure there have been situations where you have totally taxed all available uh, health care resources within a community in a certain situation. Um, 
I'm sure that in the flood business that we saw last year or the year before up and down the Mississippi that some of those cities, you know, the entire city was basically wiped out and, and so the, the needs of those people had to be treated um, in larger communities and you got into transportation problems of being able to transport somebody 50, 60, 70 miles away. And how did you do it? You know, could, could you put them in the car and take them or did you have to have Life Flight come and get them and that sort of thing? Um, who makes those decisions? Who's responsible? Well, well, usually in a situation like that, and, and I suspect that it has, it has to have some, um, uh, it will vary from situation to situation, but usually, again, the county law enforcement people come in and, and it goes okay. straight up to, you know, the county commissioners, the mayors, those kinds of people who again have thought this sort of thing through far enough to so say... So you're kind of into a civil defense Into a civil mode. defense, yeah, because it's community resource based and we're not looking at, at reimbursement and we'll talk a little bit about the communications involved with managed care and that sort of thing where that's directly, I'm providing this for you. Usually all bets are off and when that sort of thing happens um, in, in any given hospital's budget there are emergency funds or, or uh, services and, and uh, uh, dollars set aside to pay for that sort of situation and so that as part of their you know, just being a good community member they're going to set aside some funds and some resources to say if this is to happen this year then we're prepared to essentially donate personnel time and so on and so forth. It's not to say that the, that the employees that are working they'll probably get paid but no one's going to look to the to the county and say, "Gee, you know, we went out and we did thus and so for the county, so we're going to send the county a bill." Yeah, or it's, one city's not going to bill a city bill ten miles away. Yeah, it's, that's that sort of thing. Really, this this because um, it could become very expensive. Oh, yeah. For the very larger much. city very hospitals, much. if very they're much. absorbing. Sure. Well, we saw it just on a much lower situation, but we saw that about two months ago when. Uh, County, new county judge kind of came out and said, look, we're going to start requiring uh, some form of identification because Harris County Hospital District is providing all kinds of services to Matagorda, uh, not Matagorda, but uh, Montgomery County uh, residents and so on and so forth because it's that same issue. You're moving, uh, you're providing care, the care in, in Harris County at, at uh, uh, LBJ Hospital, that's a essentially a brand new hospital. It's a very fine facility and if you have a choice between that and and maybe a, a facility of uh, that's not maybe as new or as well staffed or as well stocked and, and I can go there, I'm going to go there. Well, the, the county now is beginning to say we've got to look at, at ways to finance that. But in a crisis situation, pretty much all bets are off and they're going to just try to do what they can do to take care of the patient. Yes, sir. Prioritize the. Uh, I, th I think we talked earlier in the semester about the, the immediate need of the certain certain types of people. Mm -hmm. uh, would they prioritize that just the same way? Just like whoever's the worst off, they do those people first. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's just the same. Absolutely. And when yeah. they when they decide to transport people from place to place, mm -hmm. that's always based on the priority system too. Just uh, whoever needs that certain care will go to the heart. Sure, uh, sure. You're gonna, what's going to happen in a situation like that is, um, and that little process is called triaging in an emergency room, Chapter and people two. are... <laughs> See? She, <laughs> they she did, just she, up didn't, she didn't ask me to set you <laughs> up like that. But what you, uh, what you try to do there is you've got, you know, basic first aid. You've got to stop the bleeding and clear the airways, those kinds of issues to make sure can the patient breathe. All right, if he can't breathe, uh, most assuredly he's going to die. So you're going to have to do those kinds of things. If uh, you've stabilized the patient, but you either have ex uh, just expanded or uh, expended all of your resources, you only have so many ventilators in your facility. Maybe you've got 100, but maybe you've got 106 patients. Okay, so at, at some point in a crisis of the magnitude of that, you're going to probably reach the the limits of, of the available resources that you have and so again those sorts of things are, co are coordinated very very well in, in certainly in this city and, and I think we have in Houston one of the premier 
um, uh, emergency medical uh, programs in the country, the way that the thing is coordinated through, essentially through the city with the fire department, um, those guys pretty much know if this is a situation, where are the closest hospitals and where are we going to go? I mean, if you, you know, if, if you get mangled pretty, pretty bad, we have two level uh, uh, one emergency rooms in the city, one at St. Joe and one at Herman, and well, and Ben Taub and and. Uh, uh, if you're really in trouble, then there's no point in taking you to a, an emergency room that's not going to be able to take care of, this, of the trauma. Can, can the patient request the hospital? I mean, I'm yeah. thinking years ago of a, yeah. a car wreck victim that I knew who they were about to take them to the nearby smaller hospital, and the woman said, no, take us into TMC. And she requested a specific hospital, and they did. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know... How I much? think so. Yeah, I think I think they can. I, I think it again. It, I I don't know all the all the details there, but essentially you can say take me here because I work there, or take me there because my brother's on staff there. Because or my whatever. insurance pays. Or take me there because my insurance pays me there, uh, and that is becoming more and more of a of a problem, but uh, or an issue. It's not necessarily a problem, but it is an issue, and and um, uh, you know you hope that that. It's an emergency, but you're co you're conscious, and you're it's not such an, so bad that they didn't have to pick you up off the off the pavement somehow and take you wherever they're going to take. You. Yes, ma'am. Well, relative to that, I know from from my short stint at some uh, HMOs and other things recently that if it's emergency room stuff, if mm -hmm. it's a real emergency stuff, they don't they don't question where you went. You know, at that point, it's, you're supposed to be transported to the nearest appropriate facility and taken care of, Period. and they pay for it. Yes, but and so the only t the only time you, they really start going, where do you want to go, is if it's it's not a we're now not talking dire emergency. Yes, then you better start making sure you're going to the appropriate place for you know right. your particular plan or whatever. Yeah, well, if you've got a badly broken leg, you need to go into the emergency room. But you could choose, which, you one could to go choose to. which hospital, and that might facilitate things right. long range. Right. But the reality is, uh, if it's if it's an appendage like that, um, to you it's an emergency, and in, and you're in dire pain, and you want to get it fixed. But it's not life threatening, not necessarily life threatening. And so there are most all facilities, and certainly in Houston, that have a sign out there that says emergency room. They're going to be able to adequately take care of you. And so it's, again, it's orders of magnitude and it's, it's a different situation than uh, um, what we saw. Well, you know, and, and you go back, we, again, to the ammonia truck business. That happened literally within blocks of 12 Oaks Hospital. And those guys did a, a great job, but it is not the largest hospital in the city and that was a major crisis and it literally swamped all of their resources. And so they had then to begin to say, how do we get them to St. Joe's, which is not that far in TMC, and all the hospitals in TMC, you know, began taking patients and what do we do to, and, and Memorial at that time, I think Memorial Southwest was open. It was, I um, think it was open, but not as big and, and yeah. functional as And it so, is I now. mean, there again, it was, it happened on a major freeway, so you could, uh, you know. But to kind of follow up on what Robert was asking, every emergency room has a head triage nurse. Mm -hmm. And that person is the one who is juggling whether exactly. they have five rooms or 15 rooms and decides who gets in a room and the order that those patients are treated. And they may literally pull a doctor out of one room and say, I need to interrupt you, doctor. We need you in room six yeah. because that one is more life-threatening than this one. Right. Maybe this person just needs 100 stitches, you know. But yeah. This one's in, over here is in cardiac arrest. Something else. And uh, um, now, with with the communications uh, as well as they are, and, and radios and so on and so forth, you get a sense. You know, we have a victim that's doing thus and so, and we're X number of minutes away from your front door. And those kinds of things help that that individual and others who can kind of stay on top of. You know, we need Doctor So and So because we have a patient. And that part of television is true. Yeah, that part really is true. <laughs> they yeah. really do radio in. Yeah, and, yeah. 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 stats a real word. It they is a real it. word.
it is a real word, and it uh, actually I think it's uh, it's an acronym for a Latin phrase, basically mean you know do it as as quickly as possible. But uh, um, it is a real phrase, and and it is a real situation where you where you do get into that kind of a problem where you literally are are consuming all the resources that you have at your command. Um, maybe well, we've done all that we can do. <laughs> okay, or we may come, we can come back to something we need to. Um, are there security problems that hospitals have? There other are. than locking up the really cool drugs? Yeah, no, there are security problems. Um, uh, we had, it depends a lot on, on, unfortunately, hospitals, or fortunately, hospitals are very public places, and they're very much, uh, the people that work there and, and are associated with them uh, are very caring, giving kinds of people. And if you are the type of individual that uh, wants to, to take, uh, or, or take from society rather than contribute to society, uh, it's very, very conceivable that, you know, a large metropolitan hospital could have a bag lady or two that lived there um, simply because they could learn the system and walk around and do their thing. Most major hospitals, and this is, I think, very true. Do they have bag men? Well, too? excuse okay. me. Okay. Is, what is this, uh, <laughs> gene generically correct or politically? Well, don't, just check them. I mean, whatever. You know. Sure they do. Sure okay. They do. okay. No, but you, those sorts of things uh, can happen in situations. and. And there are security problems. Um, most major teaching facilities and most major hospitals, uh, people are trained to, to help. Okay, we've laughed for years in the medical center, you could make a, a career out of uh, standing on any street corner or in any corridor in any one of those hospitals down there and just direct, direct traffic because you walk in and the person's standing there looking around and you know the poor, poor person's lost there trying to see Aunt Sally and she's on the 16th floor and they haven't got a clue how to find her. Um, and St. Luke's but, even color-coded the floors, didn't they? I think Anderson did for a while and St. Luke's used to have big, in, in Texas Children's, they, they paint walls certain colors and so you go to the purple follow elevator me. or the red elevator or the yellow and, elevator and follow the, and follow the and signs and the, and the arrows all around to try to to help get people through. And, and in those hospitals in the medical center, and all of them had a large, large uh, foreign patient population for many, many years. And so not only did you have the normal confusion, but you took people away from their own surroundings, put them in a, in a different city, many times with a different culture and a different language, and, and it was very, very hard for those people. So um, that's another whole area of communication. But Going back to the security issue, um, we used to laugh for for years that say that if you put a white coat on, um, you know, you could get the security guard to open the front door while you you know you took whatever it was you could haul out the front door of the building, and and that's probably true of most facilities. Uh, you don't tend to think you see you see the garb, the the scrubs or the white coat or that sort of thing. You see some guy walking around like he knows what he's doing. Um, quite probably, you could see a lot of, you know, a lot more theft than actually goes on, simply because people uh, are there to, to help, and they don't necessarily think of, you know, you're going to rip off my my hospital. And unfortunately, some of that goes on. Yes, ma'am. In fact, that was a real issue. I was hearing from when I was working at St. Joseph. They were saying. And strangely, and I don't quite understand this, it seemed to be a problem not only of people wandering in and just taking things, but I think got the impression it was, I guess, of patients and their families, that virtually anything that wasn't nailed down in the room tended to go out the door, yeah, the door. including That's large true. paintings. And that one, they, they hadn't quite figured out how those went out the door <laughs> without someone noticing, but paintings went off the wall. Yeah. But at St. Joseph, they were saying, I remember talking to those people there, and they said, of course, they felt even more with some difficulty because they are a large inner city hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So of course they're also subject to the, the population that's you know right this, there. This and and I, while I was working there, the, a couple occasions, people obviously with some problems kind of just wandered in off the street and 
Ian started kind of wandering through the you know offices and everything else, and yes, they had to go call security and say, "Excuse me, there seems to be a really confused or a possibly dangerous looking person here. You know, come and help them find their way out." Yeah, and that's that that happens, and it happens a lot because facilities, uh, you know, not only cater to to the patient, but they cater to that immediate community, and where that particular facility is uh, will impact all kinds of things and, and it's not at all uncommon to see uh, almost all the major hospitals in town now have uh, uh, uniformed security people. They may be off-duty uh, Houston police people or some other agency but you usually have a uniformed individual there to to help in that situation. Um, to just follow up on a couple of things, we had a situation uh, certainly when I was at St. Luke's and Texas Children's, uh, I had the opportunity to work uh, with with the laundry facility, which at that time was also associated with Methodist. And it came time to order more towels and washcloths and so on. And uh, being relatively new in my career and so on, and the, the quality wasn't really all that great. And I said, come on, guys, what are we doing? And they said, Chuck, you don't understand. If we could make it any thinner, we would, because every washcloth and every towel that we put in the room, we figure it's gone, because they're going to walk. People just simply take those towels away, and, and it's just so they said. If you know, if we could get fewer strands of, of of thread to hold the the washcloth together, we'd do that simply because it's it's going to go away. Um, there was a crisis, quasi crisis, here several years ago when it became the in thing to do to walk around in, in scrubs and greens. You saw them all over the city, you know. And uh, there again, the hospital at St. Luke's and Children's and Methodist lost uh, six-figure numbers per year in replacement of, of uh, operating greens just because it was, you know, the cool thing to wear. People were just taking uh, them out to their friends. Take them out, you know. Everybody that worked there had access to them. You'd see them on the laundry carts and they'd go by and take them and stick them in their locker or do whatever um, and they were they popped up all over the city uh, and it wasn't just it wasn't unique to those hospitals I mean I'm sure that St. Joe and Memorial and and all those other hospitals had the same problem where you uh, it was a fad it was a thing to wear and so sure enough and it comes back and it comes back to cost and it comes back to some of those kinds of issues. Um, I'm going to try to relate a, a story that uh, Dr. Hahn asked me to come talk to a class a couple of years ago, and we were talking about co just communications in general. And uh, we had a situation that happened while I, I just happened to be the administrator on call, and it just happened to happen this particular night. Uh, we had an individual who transferred from one hospital to our hospital, and uh, over the course of the night, uh, he wanted to be uh, uh, changed from just a regular admi admitted patient to a no information patient. And uh, one thing led to another, and as the story kind of evolved, uh, we were led to believe, uh, using this particular patient as the source of the information, that he was not only just a patient, but he was a, an undercover narcotics agent, and he was here to do this big bus, and he'd had this acute medical problem and uh, on and on and so uh, then we made him a no information patient and then he picked up the phone and called and asked for himself and the girl down on the switchboard told him right where he was and that made him panic so we had to tighten our procedures a little bit and one thing led to another and finally it it, it got to be he was just a gigantic pain in the neck and uh, so we looked at his medical condition and the early the next morning why his admitting physician and I went to see him and we assessed his condition such that we thought it would be fine for him to leave. That'd be, that'd be great. How long had he been there? Uh, just one day. Okay, one Actually, day. Actually, <laughs> it was long enough. <laughs> yeah. And from about the time I came on until about, and it, it was a Friday night, Saturday morning kind of thing, and we got the, got the doctor up a little early on a Saturday morning and said, we really would appreciate it if you'd come and look at this guy because he is just really giving us fits. And so... Um, when we did that and the, and the doctor said, you know, you're fine, you need to leave, well, he wasn't really in a hurry to leave and so we had a security officer with us who, once the doctor has discharged you and if you then choose not to leave, you actually are trespassing in a, in a public facility and 
So the officer made that clear to that particular gentleman. And so he, he was dressed extremely casually, but it, he made a process out of getting dressed and getting ready to go. And he had a little uh, duffel bag with him, a little bag, and, and uh, had a lot of zippers on it. And he would open one thing and take one thing in and take one thing out. And we kind of were, come on, let's, let's go, let's go. And we tried to prod him along. And he made a big project out of this. And as I sat and watched what was going on, I noticed that the officer just very casually reached over and unsnapped the clasp on the cover on the top of his revolver. And I'm thinking, hmm, I'm between the patient and the doctor <laughs> and the door. I'm not real happy about being here. But he gently but firmly you know, basically took the guy out and we got, he and I escorted the gentleman out the door and just we got him outside, he looked at us and said, by the way, can you tell me how to get to Methodist Hospital? And I was more than glad to point the way, but anyway, um, I asked the guy, I said, I saw you do that. I said, what were you doing? Why, you know, he said, well, unfortunately, I said, we have enough experience to know that in situations where you get an individual who may have a concealed weapon, he said, they'll kind of lull you to sleep by putting something in, taking something out, putting something in and you're not really paying that much attention. He said, and I was just sitting there watching the muscles on his forearm, and he said, had the muscles on his forearm tightened up, he says, I was gonna blow him away. And I thought, <laughs> right here in my hospital, please. <laughs> we want blood let's in not the hospital. Do that. I mean, that's not what we're all about, guys. But he said, you know, quite simply, we just didn't want to have a problem. And he said, I wasn't about to have him hurt, you know, the nurse or the nurse's aides or, or you or anybody else. He said, because we didn't know where this guy's head was. And, Three or four days later, uh, the story that kind of made the rounds was that apparently in some of the daytime soap operas, a story not dissimilar from that had kind of played out. And so this particular individual had come in and more or less self-admitted himself and played through this scenario and gone mm -hmm. on. And uh, caused a lot of people a lot of grief. But, so you do have a lot of crazy things to do with, with security issues. Um, because of the nature of Houston and because of the, of the capacity and the, and the expertise in the Texas Medical Center, you have a lot of other patients, very well-known patients, um, and uh, Methodist, and St. Luke's, and Texas Children's, and MD Anderson, all of those hospitals down there have at one time or another had uh, the famous, the rich, the famous, whatever you want to say about that. And, and in many cases, uh, heads of states or, or certainly high government officials and the security issues involved with that are a whole nother issue of what one does and how do you treat treat that sort of thing and uh, there again you'll sometimes get into situations where you'll have um, secret service people involved uh, those kinds of issues uh, when President Bush was in fact president um, Herman Hospital was designated as the hospital were something to happen to any, you know, the president or the first lady or anybody in that family when he was in Houston. And they had made special arrangements, um, communications arrangements with Herman and so in such a way that were something to happen, there were uh, phone lines, direct phone lines such that you can pick it up and immediately talk to the, to the White House and issues like that so that those kinds of communications over and above what we're talking about with, you know, somebody who's a famous guy or somebody because of the, of the nature of that particular arrangement. Um, and we had, uh, uh, there were people that are attached to the White House that are uh, high-ranking military people that uh, are medical military people, but they are involved with uh, front, front end work all the time. In this situation, because Houston was his hometown, they knew what, you know, they went to that hoop and put fixed assets into the Herman Hospital so that the communication links were there. But where the President Clinton went to Oklahoma City, I can assure you that there was a hospital that was identified beforehand and, and certain things transpired beforehand before he ever got there, saying, here we go, you know, he's coming, he's going to be here from this time to this time, so on and so forth, so that those kinds of contingency plans are always laid out well in advance. Do you think those were in place before the assassination of Kennedy? Or was that the precipitating event? Dr. Ron, that's a good question. I, 
I don't know. Not that I, you're old enough I, to remember. Well, <laughs> I remember that, but I, I don't know. I, I really, it would be uh, speculation on my part. I, I suspect um, some of that was, but uh, not nearly to the extent that it is now. One, because the communication capability is not what it is now, but um, uh, probably not. And probably that one issue was, was a situation where we probably thought we'd better find ways to um, make sure that, you know, and there again, uh, uh, Parkland Hospital is, is the trauma hospital, and it had been for years, the trauma hospital in, in the Dallas area. And I have no, no idea, not being that familiar with Dallas and so on, I don't know how many hospitals they went past from the, you know, the assassination attempt to get to Parkland, but obviously there again they knew this, this facility is best equipped uh, for a major trauma event like that. Nancy? There's incidents in San Antonio where, I, I, it's been years, when there was a nurse that was involved and she had a need to rescue and was sabotaged. Uh, I remember that, that they wrote a book called a Deadly Medicine. Where oh, she, oh. she was uh, she just Put got in high on their their cold life. blues. So she could save them, and a number of those babies did, in fact, die, I believe. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure of the case. Um, you know, since the caregiver's role is so important and crucial and, you know, in these traumas and, you know, uh, are there a lot of secure, are, are there security pr procedures pretty strictly? Um, uh, enforced to make sure the caregivers are, I mean, you don't have any bad eggs among the caregivers? Well, you're always, I mean, you know, it's it's a public domain that we live in, and so if if I am intent on uh, robbing a bank, I'm and I want to do it as an inside job, I could probably find a way to do that if that was what I was really intent on doing. So you're always going to run the risk that, that you know, will have a problem from within, if you will. But the vast majority of the, well, in fact, all of the people that have access to, well, not access, but are responsible for the immediate care of that patient are licensed in some way. I mean, LVNs are, you know, vocational licensed nurses. Uh, RNs are all licensed by the state. Um, so there are, and there are you know, hiring procedures and, and those people go through and check backgrounds and so on in all those facilities. Could it happen or does it happen? Yeah, unfortunately it does. We've got a lot of crazy people in this world. But as an industry, it's, it's fairly well regulated from a licensure perspective and they try pretty hard to not only do it from externally on the licensing side, but internally you get a pretty good sense most of the time of, you know, is this individual the kind of individual that you want to work in your in your subgroup because most of that stuff breaks down pretty quickly into teams and, and treatment groups and so on and you get to know people pretty well there's somebody there that's your coworker that because you have the the coverage issues that you do <coughs> where healthcare is a 24 hour 7 day a week deal uh, you get to know people pretty well and so you'll have that that kind of a thing as well this minute. I'm currently involved in, in helping a, a group um, do credentialing on, mm -hmm. on their doctors. And of course that's designed to some degree, of course, to address that issue, I suppose, and, and also to address the thing that we've started, you know, that I seem to remember there's been several famous incidences of people who flat out were imposters, right. pretending to be doctors, you know, walk right. in and, and put on the, the white coat and, and blend into the emergency room and pretty soon they're treating somebody. Right. Um, but. I'm curious about because, of course, I'm I'm in doing this. I'm having to send out letters to other hospitals and stuff, and 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 you know, like the doctors will list all the hospitals where they have privileges, and we now have to send letters to all those hospitals saying, okay, does this guy really have privileges here? And even there's a fairly detailed thing we're sending, and I'm curious how forthcoming, you know, I mean, how much of a problem do you have with sort of the let's protect our own? You don't want to say something bad about a fellow doctor or a fellow nurse or something else. And how much is it, or, or how willing are people to tell you, yeah, they, they worked here for a while and we had, we saw a problem. And we're glad they're and gone. We're glad they're gone. No, <laughs> well, what, what's going on now, and all this has, at least 
part of it, part of what you're doing, it has to do with managed care. And managed care, like, like anything else, it has to do with risk, okay? If I am going to be a, a managed care company and I say to you, um, I'm sorry, you can't go see this doctor, you have to go see that doctor, and something untoward happens to you with this doctor, and I have not done due diligence on that individual's training and so on, then I am liable for that care because you could obviously say, well, I could have gone to Dr. Hahn and she could have done thus and so, all right? Whether she could have or not, it doesn't matter. The fact is, I, I limited your choices, and so when I do that, I, by definition, have got to be able to say that I have looked at these kinds of criteria. Now, the criteria that you're looking at have primarily to do with training. Did, in fact, Dr. X graduate from the XYZ Medical School like he said he did? Did he, in fact, uh, do a residency uh, between, you know, 1983 and 1986 like he said he did? Was he on staff at this hospital? One of the other questions that you ask is how many outlying or outstanding malpractice cases is he involved in? Not, you know, not how many did he, how many times did he get sued or was he found guilty, but literally how many times? What you didn't ask was, was he first in his class? See, it's not unlike when, when uh, I give a reference to you because I want to come to work for you. Well, legally, somebody you can check on my reference and say, did Chuck work for you at this period of time? Did he come to work? Would you rehire him? not did he graduate first in his class. And what do they call a guy who graduates dead last in his medical class? Doctor. Doctor. Okay. <laughs> he's, still he's still graduated. And that's all you can do. Okay, that's all you can do is, is to go through and say, yes, he's had this training, he's received these credentials, and so on and so forth. And that's where it has to stop. Okay. Melanie. You say that most doctors have many suits. I'm, I'm not sure how common it is, but I, I hear all these things about cut down the lawsuits against doctors and, and this and that, and I'm wondering how common it is. Well, it's a two-way street. The vast majority of the physicians that practice, certainly in, 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 in America today, don't have, you know, they may have a, a suit or, or two over the course of five, ten years. You don't see a lot of, you know, if a, if a physician is named in a suit, with any degree of regularity, there's usually a reason for that. And so the vast, vast majority of these guys don't. Where there's part of that business is that, you know, we talk a lot about health care reform. And, and the reality is the whole system needs to be reevaluated and looked at. But you can't have real, honest uh, health care reform without having tort reform. Because if, you know, how does a jury put uh, some you know, value dollar amount on pain and suffering and so on. Um, and and uh, so you have to look at that kind of thing as well. The, but the number of, of suits in anybody's practice, uh, by and large, are, they're not very many. They really, and they shouldn't be. Now, the reality is I can sue you for any reason. And, and there's a fair amount of that frivolous kind of thing that's out there. But the actual suits, per se, don't, don't happen with that very, very high degree of regularity. The other thing that's, that's part of that, though, is um, external factors build in or come into the thing when you look at the situation and say, well, the malpractice rates will go up. They'll go up several years ago when the, when the federal government said that, in fact, uh, children could sue their parents for this, that, and the other thing. One of the things that came out of that was that an ob -GYN is now li uh, uh, He's not liable, but he, he could be sued for the delivery of a child up until the time that that child is either 18 or 21 years of age. Well, looking at the insurance tail on, on his uh, malpractice insurance, it just went through the roof. And we did see a number of physicians that were getting, you know, nearing the end of their career who simply said, forget it. It's just not worth it to me because I could retire today and have to carry, you know, coverage until I'm 75 years old. I just don't want to do it. Allison. Yeah. You brought up a thing that reminded me about that uh, doctor in Florida at the community hospital that amputated the wrong leg on a man. Uh -huh. How do those types of incidents, I mean, how do they 
how are they allowed to happen first off and how I mean what happens to a doctor after that I mean is he disbarred just from you know practicing at that one hospital or I've heard of other doctors that have lost their license in one state to practice but yet they go to another state and nobody knows anything about them and they're you know malpractice suits in other states I mean how does that get through the system there was a an article in over the weekend in the in the Houston Chronicle about uh, that same basic issue and they were talking about the people that right now are uh, providing care to the American Indians and and uh, uh, Alaska natives uh, apparently these are are individuals who may not necessarily have the stellar records that others may have uh, again it comes back to a credentialing thing um, it is not particularly difficult to um, evaluate an individual's malpractice history uh, it takes time it is a it is a very labor-intensive thing you, you have to stay after it but it's not very those records are relatively easy to, to come by you know in that particular situation uh, I suspect nobody in the world feels worse about that than the doctor himself I you know I don't know the details but I, I remember hearing about it and it has happened over um, over time where it, it and it can happen for a, a whole myriad of reasons uh, certainly you know just plain neglect could be one of them but quite probably you know a whole a lot of things had to happen uh, the patient you know the they I don't know they turned the x-rays around or did something silly like that but the operating room you know somebody had to prep the wrong leg okay I mean when the doctor walks in and he knows he's doing a uh, below the knee amputation and he's probably reviewed the records and so on and so forth. And there's no external sign but, of what's wrong with it. Yeah, that. I mean, and he walks in and he sees an area that's prepped and ready to go, and he starts in and he does his deal. Um, there's a lot of checks and balances in any given hospital situation, uh, and those are, you know, those are truly unfortunate situations. Um, is he culpable? Yeah, because in the operating room, it's kind of like the captain of the ship business, you know. He is ultimately responsible for everything that happens in there. Still, in all, um, the vast majority of the time, it's it's a you know it's a comedy of errors such that you couldn't you couldn't write a script and have it happen, and it, it's just really unfortunate when it does. But didn't they have several things happen at that hospital and pulled their license or something? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they had several, inc yeah. three or four incidents three or four close incidents. together. And, and they could. And, and then you need to begin to look at, at not only that individual physician, but that whole situation. And I'm not, I, I remember very briefly hearing something about it. There was another case, oh, I think in the late 1980s, where an individual who, in fact, had trained, at least in part, in Houston, was a fairly high-ranking individual in the in the uh, civil service or the uh, public health situation, and he had a number of cases pending. and And so there's usually a trail. There was a case here, oh, four or five years ago, a liposuction guy that got in trouble. Remember? And so you'll you'll have situations like that. I mean, not all these guys, you know, you don't have to be you don't have to be ethical to be a doctor. You just have to be smart. You know, you don't have to be uh, a lot of things. You just have to get into medical school and get through. And, and like any other industry, you're going to have truly remarkably fine people and, and people who really have no business being there, but they, through one way or another, got, got in and through the system. And, and there again, we get into situations. Uh, it's not so much the case now because of the overabundance and over uh, production of, of uh, qualified individuals but for a number of years um, you know we're living out here in this little community and and we don't care where the guy trained we don't care where he grew up we just need a doctor because a doctor is better than no doctor well we're we're better off than that now but uh, there was it's not been that many years ago when we we would take almost anything because we needed some kind of medical coverage in our community yes ma'am 
Uh, I was just thinking when I mentioned that about the hospital, the, the medical system does police itself. Oh, absolutely. So that if there is a problem, they, you know, and it obviously there's a problem, they jump right on it and say, okay, stop, we have to look right. at this because there's too many mistakes happening. Right. So that they're so that they do pay attention and there is a lot of communication absolutely. that goes on absolutely. nationwide as well as statewide absolutely. and on a local level. Right, Ginger, at every level, that's true. Uh, every hospital now has to have, and we go back to the the accrediting business, but every hospital has utilization review committees that have multi-specialty uh, people on them. You have nurses on them, you have paramedical people, you have physicians who go through and look at all these cases on an ongoing regular basis. What happened in our cardiac cath lab? Did we have, uh, you know, a, a number of, of hearts that shouldn't have been studied? Did we have a number of hearts that had um, an untoward outcome? Did, did something happen? Did the, the patient uh, crashed and we had to take him to the operating room, so on and so forth. So they look at a number of predetermined evaluative steps to say, are we looking correctly? And over and above that, those kinds of reports then are fed up through the medical staff uh, system through up to the chief of, of the staff. Okay, and those positions are all rotated and, and uh, elected positions, and, and it's more or less an honor. And so those guys are going to be very, very sincere about looking to make sure that we don't have a problem in any service, in any level, with the quality of care that's... Because there's a lot of pride that goes into the facility and the quality of care that's provided there. So it's a natural thing to be able to quantitate so that when you come back to the managed care people and say, yes, we do thus and so, and we have the data, to prove that we do 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 with the quality of care that we that we say we do, so that's it, it's a self-perpetuating kind of thing. Over and above that, Harris County Medical Society is involved with issues like that. Um, the State Board of Medical Examiners. Uh, there are layers and layers of of activities and and procedures put in place to try to keep those kinds of things from happening. Unfortunately, they still can and, and do to a, to a certain degree, but there's a lot of reasons for that not to happen. Yes, sir, due to security, but I, I, the question I have, or was brought to my mind, is when you have a situation like Oklahoma City and you have a lot of, how do you determine, I mean, do you even determine whether somebody is insured or not? No. Okay. No. You don't, and um, you just you know your your immediate concern there is to take care of that patient. I read a a little letter to the editor. It's over the weekend, I guess, um, and I I wish I were eloquently enough enough to be able to to parrot this back to you. Um, but in in the course of about two paragraphs, this individual very eloquently stated that isn't it ironic that that someone in this in this society of ours felt the need to, you know, to perpetrate a, a situation like that on society to because they they thought government was too big and we needed to drive people away from one another. When in fact, what's happened is it is an incredible drawing together of of caring and support and resources not only from within the you know the city of Oklahoma City, but you've had we had 17 firefighters from Houston that went up there and were up there for just over two weeks taking care of, um, you know, doing what they could to help one another out and, and the drawing of, of people together. And in a, in a crisis situation like that, cost is, is the very last thing that comes to mind. And these are government resources that are responding. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, now with, with all that you hear about, uh, you know, Health care is 12% of the GNP, and we've got to do something about costs and so on. Primarily the people that are associated with the delivery of care, they don't know if he's insured or not insured. They know he's sick, and they're going to take care of him, and they're going to do what they need to do. And, you know, it's somebody else's problem to worry about whether or not he's insured and whether or not he's, they're going to get paid for that. Uh, I know of very few physicians, and we have a, uh, we do a lot of work for lots of physicians all over you know, not only in Texas, but in other uh, cities in the country. And I can't think of, of an individual that I have ever met who would look at uh, 
a patient's ability to pay <coughs> before they they take about talk about treatment. Danger. I remember talking about Oklahoma City again. Um, the thing that, that touched me the first day was the triage nurses coming out because there was nothing they could do. And I almost felt worse for them than I did because they were ready. They, they knew what they were supposed to do. They were so ready, and there was nothing for them to do because they couldn't get to anybody. Get to anybody. Yeah, and, and again, uh, the well, I think on, on the news this morning, someone said that now everybody has said this has ceased being... Um, not is it, it's not rescue anymore. It's recovery, because they've all come to the conclusion that no one after this many days you literally couldn't live in that environment. And so, and and it's hard because you do. I mean, you're you're there to give care and you're there to provide. You know what you can do for these people, and you know you can't get to them, or there's just nothing more you can do. And, and it's it's a. It's a it's an emotional roller coaster for anybody um, in the in direct health care who you know in acute care uh, you give you give everything you've got uh, to that individual patient um, and in a you know in an acute setting if he does well fine you you know you move on to the next one in a chronic situation and you see this uh, more at, at some place like MD Anderson where they see incredible large numbers of, of patients. No, but they'll see them over an extended period of time. Um, it's it's a real emotional roller coaster that you go through when you when you treat those kinds of patients. And you're right, they we're here. We want to do something, and we simply can't get to that patient. I thought it was interesting too. The nurses, uh, one nurse in particular, that was interviewed that needed the name of the little girl that was Jane Doe that died. They treated this child, and then she died and to have an anonymous patient mm -hmm. seemed to be a very frustrating experience for them. Well, and, and, and the, the trauma, not only we think about the trauma relative to the individual patients, but the trauma of those parents and extended families and so on. I uh, um, met somebody just this week who told me that their cousin worked on the third floor of that building and was on vacation in Hawaii when it happened. Oh my! And you know, and, and she said we went we went through hoops, you know, until like midnight or one o'clock in the morning, trying to find somebody who knew what was going on, because we couldn't get through because the phone lines were jammed and so on and so forth. And all the people who worked with yeah, the person to try to were not available. Weren't, weren't available. Everybody was out, and it was very hard. Okay, we're going to take a break. We'll be back after intermission.